I'll just get started while we're waiting for people to file in the talk. So here we go. So it's my honor to introduce Alan, our very own Alan Dressler for a colloquium to start off the new semester. So Alan got his BS in physics at UC Berkeley and his PhD at UC Santa Cruz um, before he was a Carnegie Fellow and eventually a staff scientist here at the observatories. Uh, Alan is really a pioneer in the study of the evolution of galaxies, uh, especially their connection of their morphologies to their environments. And not surprisingly, Alan's received a number of prizes for this work over the years, um, including the Newton Lacey Pierce Prize in astronomy in 1983. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1996, and also received a public service medal from NASA in 1999. And especially, you know, especially now in this new age of JWST, it's important to note that in the mid nineties, uh, Alan chaired a very important committee called the uh, HST and Beyond Committee that really laid the groundwork for what later became JWST. And for this, so just a couple of years ago, this committee received the Carl Sagan Memorial Prize um, for this really important work. And then just finally the note, um, if you're interested in more information about Alan, especially his connection to the history of modern astronomy, there is an AIP oral history available online that has some really great information about um, that history. I, I really suggest you check it out. So anyway, please take it away, Alan. Thank you, Thank you Tony. Now here's my introduction. Bada, Bush, Cyril, Darwin, Alvarez, Ranowski, Ortel, Kirshner, Weiler, Golden, Cassani, Shell, and Riki. Do you want details? Or should I just leave it at that? Walter Bott is first on that list because he really was the founder of the study of galaxy evolution. In the 1950s, he made some a report of finding two populations of stars in Andromeda Galaxy. And he was able to do that uh, by taking extremely deep photos with Mount Wilson 100 inch telescope during times I'm told when the scene was extraordinary and the city was blacked out because of World War II. Now, many scientists at that time were working for the war effort. In fact, Vannevar Bush, who was Carnegie's president, was the organizer of pretty much the whole scientific uh, enterprise during the war. He was in charge of gathering and organizing whatever would be done in the war effort. But Walter Bada uh, could not get a security clearance because Walter Bada was German. So he had the opportunity to use the telescope during those moments. And this, these plates showed him that there were two populations which he ascribed to different ages. I don't think that was, a, at least if there's any other evidence of people talking about it earlier, it wasn't something that really uh, occurred to people or it felt that they could learn anything about it. It's probably more likely that. But um, I decided I would take this off if you guys don't mind. Uh, so he made this very important contribution, which I think is the founding of the field. Leonard Cyril, uh, who was our director in the 90s, uh, thought that Walter Bada was the premier astronomer uh, at the observatories. And in fact, he uh, declared that the name of the new telescope would be the Bada telescope. I don't remember any discussion at all about that. Leonard Silver also told me that the term evolution of galaxies, no disrespect, Tony, uh, is a misuse of word. This is the kind of thing he would, he would have something to say about it, because evolution in the Darwinian sense referred to forms changing into other forms and galaxies kept their identity through the age of the universe. So it was more their growth, their development that was going on. Uh, and for that reason, I don't ever use the term. It took me about 10, 15 years to get used to not using the term, but I don't get it. They don't use it anymore, anymore at all. Um, Darwin's name was in there because of that. And Louis Alvarez, who was next on the list, was in a small company with my uncle, Bob Dressler, who was a physicist, and Ernest Lawrence. And they were working on color television in the 1950s. 
and actually invented the premier you know, way of doing it with a single gun, which was then bought, the patents were bought out and never to, well, for, not for years to actually appear in a site. Anyway, Louis Alvarez was giving a physics talk and I went to all the physics talks in those days, or most of them. And uh, when I got down there, I found out it was about the idea that dinosaurs had perished on the earth because of a uh, giant collision with an asteroid, which, which was um, some work he had done with his son, who was a geologist. And they had discovered a layer of clay that sort of appeared all around the world at different sites with high iridium concentration, which was un, really unaccountable unless it was come, came from a body like an asteroid where the abundance is very high. This really took me, this was a real turning point for me because when I was in school, uh, just even in, in high school, I remember a teacher talking to us about what a mystery this was of how the dinosaurs had perished from the earth and that people argued about it, but there was really no idea. And he solved this problem, I, I believed it. I, there was a room full of very angry geologists uh, at the time, and maybe some biologists too. But um, he was right, they were right. And it changed my whole attitude about what we might learn about the past, about humans and their development. And this was about the time that there was a series uh, by Jacob Bronowski, who was a physicist and biologist at uh, San Diego, at the Salk Institute, who was talking about civilization and the role science had played in civilization, the ascent of man, he called it, man as a woman. And he, with what I had heard about the dinosaurs, made me really wonder about our role in the development of our civilization, which is a word he liked to use. So in 1993, I got a phone call from Getzortel, who was the uh, chair of the president of Aura, and Aura had been told, he had been informed, that there was a good chance, uh, maybe a 50 50 chance, that the Hubble could not be repaired, even though they were organizing a shuttle mission and building instruments to do just that, because it was a very uh, risky kind of EVA, extra vehicle activity, that they had never done before, and they were determined not to risk the lives or any you know, problems for the astronauts. So he said, we, you have to know that we're gonna pull the plug if there's any sign of danger in this. And they really thought there might be. So Getz asked me to chair a committee. Aura was kind of desperate about this because they had built the Space Telescope Science Institute. Their whole future was really set on operating that facility, that, that really large facility still is. Uh, and if the Hubble remained in its present form, it wasn't going to last very long, was the opinion at the time. I, I think that's probably true. Anyway, he asked me to form a committee, about 20 people. Uh, we did that with their help um, to address the question of what would, we, what would we do if the telescope did not succeed and we had to start a new project because he said it's going to be such a long development time. We need momentum right from the start. And we met at a time when things did look kind of bleak, but not too long afterward, they fixed the Hubble. And as you probably know, I mean, the, the effect on the community, the public was so revolutionary compared to what science usually gets from the public that uh, NASA's whole attitude, they said they would never build another space telescope when it was broken, completely changed. And my committee, uh, saw an opportunity here because they were really like, enthusiastic about the response they had gotten from the public about the Hubble Space Telescope, a, a response they hadn't really had since the moon landing and had been trying for many, many years to, uh, to have again, but that did it. So we met in 19, we met a couple times, but the third meeting was here in the new conference room uh, off there. And the 20th people met to discuss, we had at that time some ideas of what might be built. And we knew that uh, this was an opportunity to put on the back of what Hubble had done, 
a longer future with more context. So as we met there, I had sent a draft of the first chapter of this uh, HST and Beyond report. And I sat down and I looked around and nobody said anything. Nobody had said anything to me about it. Uh, and I timidly asked whether what did people think of what I had written. And Bob Kirshner, who was quite a, uh, you know, he was a resolute kind of guy, said, well, Alan, he said, I really don't think I could put my name on anything that has the word civilization and alien in it. And you'd have to read it to know why that, why that's funny. But at any rate, then there were some people in the room, clearly maybe half of them who said, yeah, this, is, this is not a science report. You don't talk about these kind of things, about the passion, about what you're involved in, the adventure of trying to find out human origins uh, in, in astronomy. But also in the room was Ed Weiler, and Ed was the head of NASA astronomy at the time. And he was what, as I remember, who popped and said, what's your problem, Bob? <laughs> and there developed a sort of discussion in the room. It looked like it was a kind of a 50-50 thing. And over the course of that meeting, I think people thought maybe we should try this. Maybe we should try to show, and not everybody felt this way, and not everybody believes that this is really what scientists are doing and they want to learn things and understand the nature. But this idea of connecting with human origins and human civilization uh, was something new for a science report. I think Ed Weiler's encouragement made it sort of a slam dunk. The report was a big success. Uh, NASA jumped on it right away and proposed to start on the project, which was a big problem because the decadal survey was like three or four years away. And we had to sort of say, well, you can't do that. But they did, made a big development effort to get started on the project. Um, and I got involved with that origin subcommittee and worked on the telescope for many, many years. Eventually, I wound up on the, uh, the uh, near cam team, Marsha Riki led. Uh, but in those intervening years, I had spent a lot of time on JWST, which, as you know, had many bumps uh, in the road, and uh, it was very, it was a near thing that it actually got built. So looking back now, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So that's, uh, I, I have a little bit more, but I think I'll save it for the postdocs at lunch. Um, <laughs> that's kind of my story. Back to... Uh, the evolution of galaxies, the words I'd ever used. Uh, this is a big turning point in this field, so I'm sort of jumping in at the middle, um, which I think was the late 90s, uh, when the community is using Hubble to measure star formation rates in galaxies in very distant universe, as you see, up to high redshifts, and they are able to measure what the sort of typical, in a volume of space, how much star formation is going on, and if you plot that up, you see this lovely log normal distribution, uh, which says it's very systematic. It's the galaxies, you know, start and grow rapidly, and then they reach a peak at a reach of two. You know, that term I don't like to use. I call it cosmic noon. And uh, it then plummeted until today, where galaxies seem to be run out of steam. So uh, it's, a, it's a very dramatic thing, and, and a lot of people, uh, I think, thought at that point, let me get the pointer out, that uh, we were done. I remember uh, it was a triumph. There was no doubt about it. It really changed the field. But many people uh, announced that the problem was solved. And I remember particularly Frank Davis Estathew and, uh, Frank Davis Estathew and White, the four horsemen, they, uh, White particularly told me, he says, we're, we're not interested in star formation in galaxies. I mean, that's a detail. It's weather. We're interested in climate. You're interested in the weather. I, I don't care about that. And there was, a, you know, for a long time, the subject really revolved around things like that. Well, the Hubble showed us that there was likely some very interesting thing going on that you could just see. Whoops. I thought that was a pointer. Oh, I'm sorry. You could just see from images. You didn't need to do any physics, basically, to see that the universe had changed. But the big problem here was there was no way to connect the dots. You couldn't figure out what evolved into what. 
And so this was not gonna be much of a way forward by itself. You had to have more real information. So the way to find out whether galaxies follow that form or whether they have individual star formation histories, which average out together to look at what we were just seeing, uh, depended on me measuring the star formation histories of individual galaxies. And the really only way to do this for, for real is to take an HR diagram, as done here for the Large Atlantic Cloud, and just find out what the different age populations are. And here is a little, uh, a real star formation history that maps out the development of the Large Atlantic Cloud, which was quite bursty. Unfortunately, for the rest of us, there are very few galaxies, really handful, that are capable of being resolved like that. And even in the future with gigantic telescopes, it's unlikely we'll ever get out to something more than a, a neighboring uh, you know, Virgo cluster galaxy. So we have the problem that when we look at the light from galaxies, it's all integrated together. So there are stellar populations that have been born at different times and evolved or have aged. And when we look at a galaxy in integrated light, we see them all mixed together. So the problem is, how do you disentangle that? Fortunately, each population has a representative spectral energy distribution, an SED, which uh, changes over time. So you might think uh, that you could sort of match up what you see in a galaxy with what populations were there. Unfortunately, as you might see here, a million years, a hundred million years, a gig year, this is 10 gig years, and everything beyond two gig years really looks pretty much alike, even the average is a little different, the shape is exactly the same. So you could look back at you, one or two gig years and you could see that population forming in a galaxy, but everything else looks old. And that's all you could say about it. This is a little uh, simplified thing here. This is an old population. This is a SED of a young one. And then there's uh, a sort of intermediate age, which is this population that's due to A stars and things that live for about a billion years. For a second. So Louis Abramson and Dan Kelson and I would march into the breach of this problem. Dan had conducted an enormous, fantastic survey called the Carnegie Spitzer Ibex survey and he had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of galaxies eventually that needed an analysis. He was not particularly after star formation histories, I think, but getting masses and redshifts right. So he developed a way to try to decompose what was going on in a galaxy, making use of the fact that from two gig years to whatever time you're observing, you could resolve something about the light and then there was everything older than that. So he developed a code for figuring this out and we used it uh, to try to uh, work on galaxies that were in the CSI survey. But we had a particular goal in mind. We wanted to see if in fact, typical uh, star formation histories followed this form. It didn't mean that they would be all identical to this, but perhaps they were homologous forms where they were sort of stretched and shifted, um, but basically this form. And there was a piece of work that had been done uh, here uh, at, the, at the ICBS group by Gus Omler, where he had discovered that there were some galaxies at about redshift 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in this whole area, which do not show up today, that have very high rates of star formation. And a lot of people had seen this for years and people said, well, they're bursts. But in fact, if you measured the mass of these galaxies, they couldn't be burst because they had masses that were vastly uh, less than they would if they had been doing that. It just didn't work out. So you had to say that uh, uh, these were things that were actually had rising star formation histories. It's quite a convincing little uh, demonstration they did in a paper that he wrote. So our idea, what we had to do was find these objects and use and look back. Okay. For two giga years, starting at say four giga years ago, all the way to sort of six. And that covered this period uh, all the way back sort of to redshift one, which is half the age of the universe. So we were able to get a handle on what was going on, not from the present day where everything looks the same that's older than that, 
but at these various uh, viewpoints and see uh, what galaxies were doing in this region at the time. And that was a beginning of checking whether they were in this kind of state or not. And what we found was that in general, um, most things did look kind of like this, either almost all old. This shows you the, the uh, star formation history, the growth of various populations. This big re rectangle here basically shows you that uh, the star formation rate is here and the mass buildup is there. And this basically shows you, we don't know when these were born, but they all make represent this first block and it's 60% of the age of the galaxy, but not all of it. So in a galaxy like this one that is shown here, 90% uh, of the galaxy was born before this last 2 billion years, um, but 10% uh, happened after that. That's not really breaking any records, but uh, something we had seen um, even for nearby galaxies. But then there were things that looked more active than that, in which it looked like the, uh, there was very little star formation before this epoch that we were looking at. And then it really shot up in the last couple of billion years. This was one of a case of sort of 50-50, and even that seemed quite remarkable. But it turned out that about 20% of the sample of these galaxies were really extraordinary in the sense that our analysis showed that more than 50% of their mass had been made in the two gig years preceding the observation at 0.4 or 0.6. And that is something that I think is still very surprising and that is not well understood. How do you have a galaxy with a halo and gas sit around for billions of years and then get going when all the neighbors uh, are way ahead of you? Um, it's about 20% of the population it's enough that you would want to know about them. It's not just a rare event. Uh, on the other hand, you can't study them today because unless you could figure out a way to really age date a present day galaxy, you won't see this episode. You won't see that they're only, their stars are only three or four billion years in general because you can't tell whether three or four billion is, is eight billion. So that's sort of the story behind this whole thing. And this is a little thing of Hubble images of these galaxies, these late bloomers, as we call them. I think it's this thing. Those are the old galaxies we are very accustomed to. These are intermediate age galaxies like the Milky Way with the kind of history that we sort of expect. Most of the stuff being formed before redshift one. And then these are late bloomers that they're up represented here as 40%, but it's about 20% of the population. And much to our surprise, they don't look very different. Uh, and that was very depressing in a sense. We, we saw, we didn't know we had images. We had our overlap in one of Dan's field with HST, but we found out that we did. And we thought, oh, we'll see something interesting about what these galaxies are. We saw really nothing. So um, an, interesting, an interesting puzzle. I put a little box here. If you find it hard to believe this, look at the color of these sort of elliptical looking galaxies and compare them to the color down there. Uh, I can tell they're not red. And they're not, they're, they have the light of A stars. And that's why they go like that. So working on the late bloomers, which didn't lead to anything, I think, as I hoped it would, led me to realize that this one gig year lifetime uh, of A stars matched perfectly with the redshift five to 12 interval period, the epoch of galaxy birth and growth. At the near cam team, which I was a member, we're participating to study, preparing to study for the uh, uh, deep fields that we're going to take in the GTO program. So, if you just stick to these templates, stellar population templates, and that evolve very rapidly over this period from 100 million years to a gig year, you should be able to untangle this integrated population problem directly without any sort of honey business. Well, the NIRCAM program did not include star for history, histories when I got there as a primary goal. And I was very unsuccessful in convincing any of them that this should be one of the most important things to do. But with Marsha Riki's blessing and support, I started uh, about 2015 to work on this maximum likelihood code that would use the seven band NIRCAM fluxes and the SED that they described to distill out what populations were being hidden in the combined light of these galaxies. And before the NIRCAM data got available, 
there was a uh, opportunity with the glass team, which I also was an occasional member. Um, they had taken some pretty deep fields uh, as part of their gravitational lensing study. Uh, and they said, sure, go ahead and you know, try your program. And I had never, of course, been able to verify whether the program worked. So uh, I was anxious to do this and very, very worried about it. So the code is a Fortran code that uses the non-negatively squares technique to combine these stellar, temp stellar templates, stellar population templates. And so, because I'm drawing out. <clears throat> so for these young populations, as we said, the star formation history and the SED are sort of linked together one-to-one -to -one because you can distinguish, you could use it as a set of um, uh, vectors that are basically not orthogonal, but they have enough angle to it. That you should be able to read off what the star formation history is. So these templates were Bruce Wall Charlot models that had been tabulated by Grant uh, Robertson. Uh, and he was preparing for the near cam deep fields. He put in emission and non-thermal continuum into the models. And, and used it to simulate the fluxes of galaxies that we thought we would see in these deep fields. Um, and that was something called the data challenge. So the templates provide fluxes for what you would get in the near cam bed for stellar populations starting at ages, say 12, you watch that one evolve down to whenever you observe it, 11, 10. They were set up like that in terms of root, uh, sorry, of uh, integer redshifts, which seems a little strange, and it was very uncomfortable to begin with, but actually I think now it worked out very well because of the discreteness of it, which is really what this method has going for it. So SEDC adds, C star adds templates together, solving for the combination that gives the maximum likelihood the best fit to the observed seven fluxes. Here's what, you're gonna show you a lot of this kind of data for the next 15 minutes. So this is the observations from the ARCAM, this was actually for the glass field uh, in this paper that I quickly went by that got published. Uh, and there are the error bars associated with it. The magenta band is the solution, the range of solutions based on these errors that the program derives. Uh, that's the fit. And the fit goes through a chi square uh, minimum here, and that defines the redshift of the galaxy, which in this case is seven and a half, and the program has made up that solution by combining together star formation, that's what this panel, starting at 12, there's a burst at 10, uh, eight, seven, six, eight, seven, whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's that combination of things that produces that, and I'm gonna show you sort of how that works in a second. Uh, is there anything else I want to say about that? They got the black points, things like that. So, and then there's the cumulative mass, which is indicated on here too. What I wanted to say was, if you know something about non-negative least squares, one does not take seriously that there's a gap here in the sense of, well, wait a minute, did the galaxy start, stop forming stars there? The, the program doesn't accept negative solutions. So it pushes it into one, corner sort of a parameter space that says, I'll get the best thing I can with a positive solution that I need. So when you see things that are like separate, but one and maybe even two epochs, uh, it probably doesn't mean there's anything funny going on, but if you see burst, they will be resolvable as such. So you start at redshift 12, the population of stars born in the redshift 12, and you ask how well can I fit the, C the SED with that population? I juggle the mass, it's 10 to the ninth solar masses. And by the way, you'll see that most of these galaxies we're gonna look at are in this range between 10 to the eighth and 10 to the ninth solar masses. And some of them get up to 10 to the 10th, but it's pretty unusual. And uh, the first, it, that's a bad fit. And you had the next, you have now added star formation beginning at 11, and you have added a new calculation of some amount of star formation at 12 that has been observed at redshift 11. So it has to be evolved. Then further, the fit is getting better. It's still pretty crummy. It doesn't get the break down here. This is a galaxy that has a live and break. And what is this? This is, uh, so we're about here in the, um, in the uh, chi-square 
and now it finally gets there, it straddles these two uh, periods is what it, and, and in this case, I actually interpolate because I could get the, uh, to say one decimal point, I can get the redshift, so I interpolate. So that's what the program does. Uh, let's advance about that. So I want to contrast this with uh, work that we've just done with NIRCAM on four galaxies at redshift 11 and 12 that were um, observed by both NIRCAM and NIRSPEC, uh, and they've got spectroscopic confirmation. This is one of them. It shows the seven bands that NIRCAM is uh, observing, and there you can see the, the, the dropout for this galaxy, which makes it redshift 12, I think, this one. Uh, the kind of output you get from Beagle and Prospector are uh, things like this. There are distributions of age, unlike what my program gives, so that you find out, you know, in this case, it's a fairly young galaxy. Things only stretch to 100 million years, but you do get this distribution. And you have to, the way the program works, you have to put in some priors about what kind of distribution you're expecting. And then, as you all know, because you all do this, uh, there is a sort of triangle of parameters that then you see whether your priors actually match what you get out. And if not, you try to change them. And this one, you know, it came out pretty straightforward. It's a youngish galaxy, but it does have, uh, these are actually all four of the galaxies and they're, they're somewhat different. So my program is different than that because there are no free parameters. There is only a solution that it finds a maximum likely solution. That doesn't mean it's correct. It just means I don't have any, you know, I don't have any control over it. I can't say, the referee for this first paper wanted to know, well, you say it's a burst. I see that, but uh, how do you know it isn't the long story? How can you prove it? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> so this was, a, the, there weren't many uh, examples here. They're studying this uh, clusters, nice data, but we actually had some issues with trying to make really uh, flat good data with this thing. But uh, I, as a matter of, let's see, this. Sure, sure, please. I'm sorry. Well, that's what it calculates. That's so those who work are like those coefficients, in fact, are the people. If they were bad spectra, if they were bad representations, if there was an argument about what templates to use, for example, whether it was this set of templates and that set of templates, that would be a free parameter. What did you use? But as for combining them with any given set of templates, if they are the proper ones, it's going to calculate the maximum likelihood and that's it. So does that sort of answer the question? Maybe just a question of nomenclature, but I would call those like five or whatever, however many you have, I would call them free parameters. Because you, that's what you're well, it's not free parameters. It's been done by astronomers have measured the light description. And here's where A stars comes in. The templates that have to do with A star light are extremely straightforward. There is no metals in the atmosphere. There is no complicated evolution. Uh, they dominate the light over this period. So I believe those uh, templates. But I, I believe that they're within the range that this kind of star formation history cannot change. More to the point is the errors that are associated with it. And you'll see some of these things have pretty good size error bars because the photometry is just not that good. And that, it, it does the best it can, but it gives you an error bar too. That's why there's that band of solutions that shows if you perturb the errors 20 or so times, that's what you get. So it's the best answer I think I could give. <laughs> uh, this is from that first paper, um, and it's, galax it's galaxies that I characterize using this technique as bursts. So there's, star there's a star formation history and then another one, which a single burst of something like 10 to the 9.5 solar masses produces a very good fit to the SED in both cases. These are more complicated bursts, where there's a burst at the beginning and then a long gap, which is probably real, and then a later star formation, and you see some things that are sort of more stochastic looking. They're just pops going off. And maybe there's something here that looks more systematic. So this is about half of the population of what I find are bursts. So I think 
This answers a question that has long been suspected that galaxies assemble from mergers and such, and we should expect very extreme conditions when mergers happen and start from it with a lot of gas and star formation goes rapidly. Uh, it's super obvious what the top right is interested. Why this one? So the top right has just a single Earth. Right. But the bottom right looks like it has sort of like a constant amount of star formation over your yeah, yeah. shape. Yeah, this is really sort of a, I don't know why I put this in, but it's a transition to the next step. Okay. But yes, I agree with you. I mean, this, this, I, you know, is this like, it's one galaxy doing this. There's no doubt about that. You're looking at the same object yeah. and it looks like it's part of a trend, but there definitely are things where I am putting in here quads where it just goes off at various times and they look different by an order of magnitude and mass. So they really don't look like it's a continuous thing at all. Um, yes, Dan. Yeah. I mean, if you can go back to that plot, uh, right, right now, see, you have, on that example, right, no star formation zone for the first two red Yes. Right? So it is something that's starting low, may, maybe undetectably low, but... Oh, yeah. And then it rises. And if you think about how much time that is over that redshift period, yeah. it's, it's still a few hundred million years or several hundred million years. I mean, that, why wouldn't you call that a burst? I mean, it's, it's not... Well, it's not yeah, it is... It is high and going down. Yeah, I mean, it starts low, it comes up. Yeah. And it starts... I guess that's why I put it in between. Yeah. Because it's... The is just to make this question to me, why would that be a burst? Uh, you know, I think also the fact that it's a lot kind of confused me for a second. Uh, yeah. There's nothing old, and then suddenly it's getting up for a few hundred million years. It's not going to be easy to put make boxes for these things, right. and I'm doing my best to sort of make general categories, but... I've actually kind of kind of found a way to do it to my satisfaction in a code um, to distinguish. Now, let me go to the other end of things. Here are examples. These are not so common. They're like 10 or 20% of the population where there is apparently a long history of star formation starting at redshift 12 and coming right on down. Uh, they look like they're all connected. Uh, they're very good fits to the models. They're very well detected. And I think, you know, they're very strong cases. So there are things that have what I would consider long star formation histories that are coherent over the entire time. And the reason I made that emphasis about gaps is the way the program works and the, and the goodness of the fit that you get at different ages very slightly. And I think there's sort of a dis... Uh, what am I trying to say? A kind of a disfavoring of a middle redshift range where I often see there's a gap uh, but I think that's just the way the program works and its ability to distinguish uh, things in that gap from the next on the other side. So the star formation is all there and how it divides it up is a bit arbitrary in the sense that it has these points and it does the best job it can. How you interpret that. Can be better. Now, Nick, to your point, look at these. Almost more commonly than the long ones I showed you are these things with three epochs of star formation. They clearly are contiguous uh, this is like 30% of the population. And certainly this means something. Dan has correctly pointed out that even though they seem shorter, the epochs are quite long here. So they, these three epochs correspond to half a million years because they're spreading out with the integer redshift thing. So these are a star formation continuous that goes on for something like a half a billion years. And, and maybe they seem to be so common, maybe this is uh, sort of the M star galaxies and how they get started. You also raised an interesting point, I think Dan did about, what about the rising part? One of the things I learned from this exercise is it's very hard to detect the rising part because by the time you're looking at this redshift six, let's say, the stuff at redshift 11 has faded, whereas the light from the young population is going up. So it's, very, you know, much masked out. That's not to say we never see it, but unfortunately we know that these guys came up, but I think it's down here where I, I just can't see it because of the later star formation. So those are those three types. Uh, we're not gonna spend any real time on this, but just to satisfy the referee, I made some simulations, which I had started to do because we had no, the, this data challenge that the, uh, that the NIRCAM team produced had no star formation histories. It had galaxies with populations that were basically current 
star forming or, or older. Uh, and they were, uh, they, they were not, they were not modeled to have either uh, some sort of uh, para parametric uh, star formation history or stochastic or bursty or anything. So I had no way to test the program. So I started building uh, actually some stochastic models of making bursts and saw how well I could recover them. For this paper, I just wanted to show that if I put in, so the, the program can be run in either direction. This is my claim that there's just a one-to-one -one relationship between if, if, if the templates are right, between uh, what you uh, massively make and the SED. It's just one is derivable from the other. So I took the masses that came out of uh, one of some of these observations and put them in and said, using the templates, what star formation history makes those, and then ran the program to recover it. So the question is, this is the predicted star formation history, and the green boxes are, again, there's a quad here, and you can see that in Orion's belt here and basics. So they're, they're not perfect by any means, uh, but generally they seem to do the job. Ugh. This is also for the referee. I did what I showed you in that first cartoon of adding things together. I just, from the beginning, right to 12, 11, I just showed how these, for three got more galaxies, uh, how the uh, SED changed when I added these templates like that. That was one way to try to demonstrate the method work, but I found a better way, I think. Thanks to uh, Chris Burns' help on, and I meant to mention, he is my really true colleague on this program uh, with tremendous help in data processing and presentation. And what we did was we found a way to run the program and record those epochs, what were they contributing to the SED? And so, for example, a burst, there are two bursts up here. The burst makes the SED, that's all you need. Down here are some things with, these are, you know, adjoining, but they are separated by 20, 200 million years or so. So there really are two different SEDs associated. I should point out that the little arrow means the program has something I really should have said, the burst, I make the, the galaxy from bursts. At that epoch, it's a burst, but seen at the next epoch, it's just star formation. It's an aging population. There are no young stars in it. So the burst is just a convenient way to say how many stars formed in there. But I also have a set of templates that are ongoing star formation. So they're active at the end of that period. And when you see a little arrow, that means that the epoch of observation uh, it picked up continuing star formation. There was enough power in the emission lines to perturb the uh, bands of the SED. More complicated things, three different things summing together. And I hope everybody could just see these things add up to that. And here's an important case. So here's a burst at redshift 12, 11, and the galaxy is not observed till redshift six, it has some ongoing star formation. You cannot make this SED, you know this really well, you cannot make this SED without adding old stars that makes this SED at the time of observation. Another case here, very similar and something here. So this was very important to me to show that I was recovering star formation all the way back to the beginning, like I said I was, because so much of the argument that follows from this depends on that. And these are some of the long ones. As you see, they get quite complicated. This is kind of an interesting case with a double burst on both ends. Uh, matches the SED perfectly. Wouldn't if you didn't have those things. Not much more that I could say about it. The, the fact that you could distinguish uh, the different contributions to see that it's 5%, sometimes it's 1%, 2%, you know, you could ignore that. That's in the noise. but. It, when you find things like this, you know, it's a big contributor to the, to the mass. This is doing the ultraviolet light here and the, and the drop off uh, is the, is the Lyman alpha Lyman break, uh, but it needs some old populations uh, to make the SED go up like that. And generally anything that is rising uh, is gonna have the old population and contributes most of the light. Yeah. That one in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. I didn't mean to put that in there. 
get to a redshift that is, if you, you know, even the sense of being kind of something like that, that has more of the violent flux, you know, could there be any, any APN activity contributing or you know, what? I don't think so. I, this thing is, I, I'm trying to remember why I, this got in my mistake. So let me just ignore it. But it has, as you say, a very, very blue. Um, I don't, he barely was able to draw anything through there. But this is lime and alpha and carbon for it's possible it's real. I wouldn't really put too much in. And there are occasionally things like that, and I usually throw them out. So in the remaining time, I think there's all that much. Uh, I've done the next best thing. I tried to write a little code that applies to this kind of things we were just talking about. Are they burst or stochastic? Burst is one, number one. Stochastic, sort of several things that look disconnected, is two. Three are the short star formation histories, and four are the uh, long star formation histories. And if I had only put the color code thing here, but I bet you could guess red is for uh, burst, orange is for uh, stochastic, green short uh, star formation in blue. So you can see some large scale structure in this. I think this is all real. Uh, and this is just between the interval of six and seven. Uh, I fancied when I first saw these, this one for in particular, that there's a big increase. You could see in the number of log star formation histories that are detected at seven to eight, have no idea why that is, but they're clearly a much higher percentage. Uh, and I, you know, looking at this, I got very, sort of tempted to think that they, they lay in the more dense area. Local density maybe was influencing whether they were those kind of galaxies that had long uninterrupted star formation histories. But as I will show you in a moment, I didn't really find anything. And this is eight to 10. So those things are interesting and I'm gonna explore them some more, but. So the local density for these different populations looks like this. Uh, and you could see that the densities represented particular, this is a poor sample because they're just not very many of them. Um, but in the higher redshift sample, uh, where you really do have enough objects, you don't see any difference between whether they lay in um, high bridges of local density or low. Interesting. I thought I might come in here with the, you know, the old morphology, star formation yeah. density thing, but not to be. That's why we do the science, right? That's why they play the games, as I say. So uh, down here is the distribution of galaxy mass. And that is a little interesting. Uh, this is at six and seven. You could see there's apparently a displacement. And then with the larger sample, you could see that it really is true that these things extend are more massive in general and extend to higher masses. They're a much bigger proportion. So. I'm going to leave you with something that I think is very tantalizing. This is a map of 257 galaxies in redshift 6 to 12 with SEDZ finds significant star formation in the first two epochs, 12 and 11. So I'm presenting you with a map of galaxies at redshift 6 and 11 and 12. Their light has been added to so that they are actually at six and seven and eight redshifts. But these are the positions of galaxies that were born at redshift 11 and 12. So it's, I think, the first time we've actually mapped the sky. And this is the beginning of the reionization epoch. And the other ones I would show you were sort of the end. So it will be very interesting to follow up the evolution. I'm, co I'm uh, collaborating with Dan Eisenstein on trying to make some sort of a autocorrelation uh, exercise here uh, to find out uh, whether the structure is discernibly changing over these redshifts. I'm sure that people will be skeptical of this, but I think I could prove to you, in, well, I tried to prove to you already that when I say there's redshift 11 or 12, it really is there, but I think I will provide one more demonstration that should seal the deal. Can you see, oops. Can you see this cluster? Here, there are 13 galaxies in this little region, which I have blown up here. Oh, I could see, there you see that. In one square arc minute, there are 13 galaxies. I did this last night. 
I said, all right, let's look at the spectra of those. I was very nervous about doing this. Every one of the 13 shows a very excellent recovery with just like I showed you. These are what they looked like. And these are the ones I would feel very secure in because of the strong contribution that the light makes. These are half of them, and these are the other half. So I think this is kind of neat. And uh, you might wonder, since the NearCab team worked very hard to publish four Redshift 12 galaxies, how I have managed to find 250? It's a very good question. But the answer must be, at least partly due to the fact that they grew, became much brighter. And at the time, uh, would they, you know, they were, it's not a very substantial red population, some not so much, but they have faded a lot. Uh, and so it's not clear you would see them very well. I don't know, it's a very good question, but I have no doubt about uh, the detection here. Yes? This is really cool. Um, if you add up the star formation and capacity, okay, you have a sense of volume. You have an SFRD, a star formation yeah. density for red, redshift of 11 and 12. Yes. What does that look like on the canonical, you know? It looks high to me, but, you know. I, is it at the right place? I mean, it won't be far off. I'm just sort of curious. Does it suggest that there's, you know, what has been estimated so far is off by factor two, four, or is it right on? I think the estimates are that the models were sort of wrong by maybe an order of magnitude. I, you know, since last night I haven't had the, but that's a very good idea. I can calculate that. And of course, have information after that. That's right. So all the way along, I should be able to do that thing and see if it made said that. You know, if there was a other explanation for what I've done here, I think I would tell you, but I don't know of any. I think this these are convincing measurements from the reason I told you. So I think I made a little summary here. So this first study of discrete star formation histories for the first galaxies has showed that because of the favorable properties of these intermediate age stars that allow you to sort of distill the, uh, uh, the star formation histories rather than sort of model them, uh, the mass buildup is uh, recoverable in a, in a pretty straightforward way. It could solve for a star formation history uniquely over this first, except for the question of star, rising star formation histories, which is a problem. Uh, these new near-cam data, data are deeper and um, more cosmetic. It's very challenging, actually, to get all the little glitches out of the uh, imaging with their cap, although eventually it's they're quite spectacular. And uh, conferred this idea that there are sort of three basic types and they're the kinds of things you would have expected. Um, I think it is very interesting that half of the things are, are starting life as bursts. Um, I think that did surprise me. I expected there some of it, but it looks like a fairly large fraction start that way. And how do they pick up later or, you know, I don't know. Remember that, these things I've showed you are sort of 10 to the eighth to 10 to the I solar masses. These are things that grow into 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 11th. So they got a long way to go. It's very true. So uh, this idea, which we actually now have started, and I started last night, of comparing what we learned from redshift 12 and 11 galaxies directly, defining them to a populate what we could observe of their descendants, which formed from that same time. Uh, and I would really like to get enough. There's more data, a lot more data coming. I could get maybe larger samples to look for some more subtle effects with how the star formation, it has been a goal to find how star formation histories change from one to the other. It's going to be hard to do that, but I think there's sort of a uh, continuity equation that can be applied because you're watching things turn into other things that may help pin it down what, what is the distribution of star formation histories at each epoch? Does it, does it change over this period of time? I showed this because I thought it looked good in a black background like it actually is. Thank you very much.
Great. Thank you for a really nice talk, Alan. So if you guys have questions in the audience, I have a microphone that we can pass around or um, if there's people online also, either you can unmute yourself or type it into the chat and one of us can ask for you. So here, Ethan, it's already, it's already on. Thanks, Alan. Um, in terms of connecting the dots, do you see, for example, in maybe the Redshift 7 or 8 galaxies that you recover here, are any of those consistent with having descended from the really extreme Redshift 11 or 12 galaxies that people have reported, for example, in the spectroscopic data? Like, what are the most extreme outliers, and can you somehow connect uh, their, their star formation histories? Let me see if I understand this. You're saying uh, at the later times where you have big samples, are they connectable to the things that were published? Yeah. I guess that's the question I was trying to address at the end. What distinguishes? Clearly, people are now pointing to telescope that are coming up with 11 and 12 all the time. So I think those are the most massive example. And all of them had very young populations. Um, so I don't know. I think that that's, that's, a, that's a real riddle. I first got this result about detecting them. Uh, I was sort of skeptical about it, but I, you know, I think the method is quite reliable. So we'll have to see. Um, and to make those numbers where there's a big difference between uh, how many of these should I see in that field and what do I look for, given what we know at large? Good question. And, Thanks. Great talk. Um, so I was curious, and you kind of alluded to this, um, I think, uh, at some point. Well, what does your code assume about the, the nebular emission for these, uh, for these young populations? Actually, um, it's in there because Bram put it in there. I don't think anybody who's been doing spectroscopy, I, I think I have some objects which are highly obscured. So maybe there's places where star formation really is the dominant thing. Uh, but uh, it's surprising, no, no dust has been added to any of this. And I think there's some galaxies that need it in there, but they're very rare. And that agrees with, I think, everything people have found so far. Of course, there's a selection effect. Those are the ones you see, but it looks like we already got too many galaxies that if they were all dust obscured, we'd really be in trouble. So uh, I think uh, it's a minor contributor. And I think people were wise to put that in there because we really don't know about the intensity of star formation and how whether the nebular emission could be playing a role. But so far, I haven't, uh, there's nothing in, I need to add to, to this that's sort of, but I, I have to look into that, I think, add the dust more carefully. But it is it is contaminating to the, or like contributing to the the broadbands and and potentially it, explaining it some is, of the dust. Well. only in the last epoch, right? Sure, so right. Star formation is only in the last epoch, current star formation. That gives me a big leg up in the sense that they might get something wrong about the very last one on a lower window. But, but uh, and even in that one, there's a lot of stars that formed when that, you know, as I said, that at those epochs at the end where most of the things are detected at star forming are the last one is 240 billion years old at which of six. So over that epoch, it already formed stars that block out most of the light from the star forming stars. It's just that this happens that way. Thanks. I think questions here. Yeah, oh, oh, this is weird. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, what do the objects look like? And <laughs> do you see correlations between your classification and their morphology. Wouldn't I like to know? You know, <laughs> I had to work so hard on the code for the last month for reasons of getting this dis distillation into the various different components that I never got to that. I have, there's a program, I have a link to a program which has all the images on it, like you saw. It's something called Jay's View. Uh, for a person who has always been looking at images, it's pretty. Amazing, don't you think? <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I didn't do that, and I'm very curious. Maybe you'll do it with you, so keep me honest. I don't know. I have no idea. You know, generally, people say they're all small. They're tenths of an arc second across, uh, a kiloparsec. So I don't know how much we can expect to see, but I hope there's something to see. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, it's, it's the last. Um. 
Samit, this is following up on what Ethan asked about. So what is the lowest mass of at Redshift 12 that you would kind of detect? I know it depends a little bit on kind of what happens afterward and kind of how well you can disentangle it, but kind of, you know, it, yeah. idea like best case scenario, kind of what is the lowest mass yeah. that you would be able to detect? At I don't, you know, I don't know why this is true, but I, we, oh, oh, this 10 to the 8th is sort of the beginning of the fall off all the way along. And I could see that just for doing so many of them and seeing what the error bars. I don't think I showed anything with big error bars, but there definitely are. And they always go down sort of. So I see things at 10 to the eighth and maybe a factor of two under that. And then I think, uh, and 10 to the eighth, 10 to the six is invisible. So somewhere 10 to the seventh, I think is the lower limit. And how many I would expect to actually see there? I don't know, but that's where the, that's where the ball game is basically. Mm -hmm. 10 to the eighth, I would say is the last really easily recoverable amount. That's cool. Can you, sorry, I'm already imagining, you know, mass, uh, mass function at pressure 12 that you can construct. Yeah. How do you, uh, and maybe a silly question, but like, I really like how you show like this uh, in the different epochs uh, and different colors, but like, is the universe sufficiently smaller that they would be kind of at the ratio 12 galaxy should be kind of more Kind of compact like it would actually be uh, saying make it more representative of time yeah you know i really thought that and i thought gee this is really kind of this i was because of it but in a funny way i now think that 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 scaling is appropriate because mm -hmm. you think about the universe's evolution and, you know i have had sort of a chip on my shoulder about finding the highest redshift galaxy which has dominated this part of the field for so long and still does uh when the next one is 30 million years older than the last one. <laughs> and the stars and them are all, you know, things that are 100 million, 500 million years old. So what's different about it? Well, the conditions of the universe are changing very rapidly to high powers of the, of the scale mm -hmm. and density and such. So how that influences the galaxy, you know, four big stars and, and evolving from that point is not exactly clear. But it's clear that if you were to just throw 12, 11, and 10 to get the same amount of time in there, you'd just be losing a lot of stuff you could actually resolve. Whereas later, you probably can't resolve it because time has gone on and they're more like galaxies we know now and they know that the time scales are long. That's kind of the way I came to peace with it. Uh, I couldn't do anything. You know, this were the templates I was given. And <laughs> the program followed for what I had to do it. but. Uh, I don't know. I guess I could try doing that and see if it uh, leads to any insights. I'm not sure. sure. But I guess what I was really what were you getting thinking at? about is kind of that the universe would have been like, you know, at ratio 12 versus 8, the universe is smaller. And so maybe the, the blue points, I think those are ratio 12. Should be no, kind of closer red, together. red points were. Okay. Anyway, the ratio 12 points, like, shouldn't like they be kind of. Maybe I was getting at it like physical versus like apparent distance, like that they should be like if it, when you mentioned that you you're interested in measuring the clustering, yeah, uh, then you would probably need to correct for the the, the yeah universal smaller. that's for sure because yeah. of the thickness to these right yeah and I haven't haven't uh, really faced up to that yet and that's why I'm getting help from Harvard right. Yeah, anyway, again, it might kind of relate to what Ethan was saying to kind of get a sense of kind of per square degree, kind of how many we would expect to see at Redshift 12 of each method. I think that would be pretty, pretty cool to have this number. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's something to do. And by the way, for people who are colorblind, and I know Ian Thompson is, has a form of colorblindness, <laughs> I apologize for uh, having to do that. And I will make black and white versions available to anybody here. In fact, they were black and white versions for a while. Well, thank uh, you again. All right. Yeah, I don't see any um, questions online, but you can find Alan, I think, if you have any more questions for him. But yes, thank Alan one more time, please. I know you're going to watch the post office stuff, but. but... That does not look very patchy, so it'll be really interesting. Oh, it does look patchy. Well, I, you know, maybe I'm going to look at this. Right? Yeah. So, you know, that's about one arc minute. Yeah, it's four by six. 
so I'm, I guess I'm trying to remember what the. I, don't know, I, see, I see a lot of this stuff, you know. Yes, you do. You and do. I see some pretty big empty regions. It doesn't look right. Yeah, that's what I would want to yeah. do that correlation function thing. Right. I think you're going to find it's pretty clustered. Well, I mean, look, it should be. Yeah, that's amazing. Look at that. So there are several places in the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's, I mean, this, this is the most distant cluster in the universe it's, so far. 